Hello and welcome to Parasha Express, the weekly fix for spiritual lessons taken from the Parasha. Have your coffee and let's take a look at the weekly Torah reading. Today we'll be looking at Parasha by Yachel, which runs from Exodus chapter 35 verse 1 to chapter 38 verse 20. Enjoy it and don't forget to give us your feedback on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube or via our website. Is it a person? Or a landscape? Perhaps an animal? Personally, I think my children draw better pictures, but perhaps the saying is true, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I'm talking, of course, about abstract art. Have you ever been to an art gallery and seen large canvases, perhaps of one or, or two colors, with dull names like orange, red, yellow, or blue one? To someone like me, an art philistine, these pictures seem dull and inconsequential. I could go on and on about the waste of funds and resources in displaying these pictures, and yet people flock to galleries to see abstract paintings. The difference, of course, between what my children draw and what these famous artists paint is one of purpose. Abstract art is supposed to leave the meaning of the piece open to interpretation. Everyone is supposed to draw something different from the work. It is purposefully created to get us to think. Why? Because symbology is a powerful tool. These artists express on their canvases what's going on in their souls. For this week's parasha, we're back at the foot of Mount Sinai. This time we read about how the different items for the Mishkan, indeed the tabernacle itself, are constructed. We read about the building of the Ark of the Covenant, the altars, the menorah, the table for the bread, and the bronze basin for washing. You'd be forgiven for wondering why all of these details are given again, seeing as it's almost identical to what is written in Parashat Truma. Perhaps our thoughts about abstract art can help us to understand what's going on here. Throughout the Tanakh, we read about God speaking to humans. Over and over again, God communicates either directly, in the case of, say, Moses or Abraham, or indirectly, for example, through the prophets, with people. He is the God who talks, the God who communicates. But God knows full well that people learn in different ways, and that hearing something doesn't always mean we'll listen. So he instructs us to make the Mishkan with all its various pieces of furniture because they're supposed to be symbols of a deeper truth. Sure, they fulfill practical purposes, like allowing the priests to wash or have light to work by, but as we read, we get the feeling that each piece of furniture, like a piece of abstract art, is inviting us to learn something about its designer. However, of course, unlike abstract art, which can have a thousand different meanings, God wants to show his people something very specific through each piece. So get comfortable and pull out your glossy brochure as we take a tour of God's gallery of symbolism in the desert. Our first stop on our guided tour of the Mishkan is the tent itself. It's pitched right in the middle of the camp, which shows us that God is the most important. Indeed, he's supposed to be our king and the most important part of our lives. It shows us that he's concerned with our lives, a God who wants to be near, not far away. And yet the fact that there are different barriers and compartments shows us that we have to approach God on his terms, not ours. Much like with a modern head of state, our ancestors couldn't just stroll into the Kodesh HaKadoshim whenever they liked. In fact, only the high priest, the representative of the people, was allowed there, and that only once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. God wants to be near to us, yes, but he's also someone who demands respect. Next, we read about the altar, a savage symbol of justice and consequence. As we'll learn in Vayikra, if we want to get close to God, we'll need a sacrifice of some kind. The perfect God cannot tolerate our imperfection, and so a substitute must die on our behalf. The altar is a reminder of the justice of God against our brokenness, and yet also his mercy in allowing a substitute. Next on the list is the altar of incense, a symbol that God listens to us. Incense is a symbol for prayer, talking with and listening to God, a symbol of the relationship that a good father has with his children. Following the incense altar, we read about the table for the bread. Bread, as our people will later learn, represents sustenance, the basic things that we need to exist. It's a reminder to us then and now that God is ultimately the one who makes sure we have enough. 
The bronze basin for the priest to wash in shows us that God wants to ultimately wash us clean from our imperfections. Or to look at it from the other way around, it shows that we're dirty and that we've soiled ourselves and we need to come to him and ask us to make us clean. All of us have soiled ourselves through the bad things we've said, done or thought. No one can claim to be perfect. Finally, we come to the pièce de résistance, the major highlight, the showstopper, the Ark of the Covenant. This is the place where heaven met earth, where a perfect God makes perfect, imperfect people. This was the place of forgiveness, a place where justice and mercy meet, a place of hope. Perhaps as you're listening to this, you feel a hint of skepticism or even a sense of boredom. After all, in the 21st century, we don't ritually slaughter animals nor wash ourselves in a big bronze basin. What does all of this have to do with us? All of the symbology that we've just looked at during our whistle-stop tour of the tabernacle is like a treasure map. It's a map that shows us how to get to God. It shows us who God is and what He requires. He's a perfect being that longs to have a relationship with us, but He can't because of our wrongdoing. So He prepares a way for us to reach Him, a substitute who can take on the punishment that we deserve in order for Him to be able to wash us clean, forgive us, listen to us, and provide for us all that we need. The Mishkan was a blueprint for another sort of Mishkan, if you want to keep the symbology, that we would encounter thousands of years later. The Messiah. When Yeshua came to the earth, He called Himself the Temple, the Mishkan. He would ultimately fulfill the symbology of the art gallery in the wilderness and become the way to reach the ultimate artist, God. Thanks to His death and resurrection, we can draw close to God. If we choose to go another way, hopping over the fence or barging our way through, it will mean disaster for us. Thankfully, we don't have to. We have a way. Perhaps you like thinking abstractly, or perhaps you don't. Perhaps you love looking around the Tate Modern in London or the Daimler Contemporary in Berlin, or perhaps you think it's all a waste of money. Whatever you think about abstraction or symbology, there are powerful tools to help us to learn and understand complicated concepts. Thankfully, God wants us to understand Him. He wants you to understand that whatever situation you're in at the moment, He loves you and He longs to talk to you and hear from you. He's the good Father that you maybe never had. He's the one who will provide for you if you let Him. And He's the one who can change your life and wash away all the garbage. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Are you willing to go His way? That's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed our Parasha Espresso. Please don't forget to subscribe to make sure you get the latest episodes. We'd love to hear from you, so please get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or via our website at youdenfearjesus.de.